Jordan, who was 31 years old and did not play competitive baseball since high school, had modest success with the Barons in 94, batting 202 with 3 home runs, 51 RBIs and 30 stolen bases in 127 games. But his earns left an indelible mark on those who interacted with him on a daily basis, several of whom reminisced about it in interviews with Alcom. It was a magical year, Nelson said. I could truthfully say, I don't think I've ever been so mentally and physically worn out after one season, because you were always on the clock. You were always doing something. And you never knew who was going to be at the ballpark that night Jordan retired from the NBA on October 6, 93, less than four months after leading the Bulls to a third straight championship and little more than two months after his father, James, was murdered in North Carolina while taking a nap in his car. Jordan has never come out and said so publicly, but many believed, then and now, that the trauma of his father's death pushed Jordan away from basketball into a baseball, his father's favorite sport. Jordan signed with the White Sox on February 7, 94, shortly before his 31st birthday. He said at the time he was ready to try and prove the doubters wrong, though he conceded he might not be able to do so after such a long layoff from baseball. I've never been afraid to fail, Jordan said, according to the Associated Press. That's something you have to deal with in reality. You're not always going to be successful. I think I'm strong enough as a person to accept failure. But I can't accept not trying. He didn't get much benefit of the doubt. Two weeks into White Sox spring training camp in Sarasota, Florida. Sports Illustrated published a cover showing Jordan swinging and missing with a headline bag at Michael. Jordan and the White Sox are embarrassing baseball in the accompanying story. SI veteran Steve Wolf wrote, this much is clear. Michael Jordan has no more business patrolling right field in Chemiskey Park than baseball legend Minnie Minnesota has bringing the ball up coach for the Chicago Bulls elsewhere in the story, caustically titled Air Jordan, a number of baseball stars past and present expressed doubt Jordan could ever become a major leaguer, at least not on merit. Jordan never forgot the slight. To this day he refuses to speak to anyone from sports, illustrated on the record. Jordan had no intention of throwing in the towel, however. By the end of March, the biggest question was when the White Sox's minor league Cheney would be assigned. When Martin covered the Birmingham minor league teams, first the Ezen and the Barons, for more than 20 years beginning in 71. He said the Barons would view it as the top contender to get Jordan, thanks largely to the facilities at the Hoover Met, which had opened in 1988. Another thing the Barons had going for them was a well-respected manager who played in the major leagues, and was thus used to dealing with star players and their egos. Terry Tito Francona, then 34 and just four years removed from his playing career, had guided Birmingham to the Southern League Championship in 93, his first year as the team's manager. On March 31st, the official word came down that Jordan was headed to Birmingham. The news spread quickly around White Sox camp. I remember that morning so well, Francona told veteran baseball writer Rob Nair in 2017. We would have minor league meetings every morning at 7.30, just to sort of go over the day, talk about the players. That morning I was tired, barely listening. Then somebody said Michael would be with a Birmingham work group, which meant he was coming to Birmingham. Well, I still didn't think much about it. By the time I got outside, the media already had the news. I realized my world had been turned upside down, and it was the best learning experience I could ever have been placed in. All of a sudden you're dealing with tech couple and hard copy is following the bus, and you're walking a line like you're supposed to. Though Martin was in Sarasota covering Barron's camp as he did every year in those days, the team's front office staff was back in Hoover making preparations for the season, which was set to open April 7th at home. The Baron staff then numbered around 10, including general manager Bill Herdekup, whose office was near Nelson's desk. Late that afternoon, Herdekup took a phone call from Ron Schuler, the White Sox general manager. He got up and closed his door, Nelson said. At the point, I had a pretty good idea that Michael Jordan would be assigned to Birmingham Curd Bloom, then as now the Barons radio play-by-play man, still had his doubts. He wouldn't believe Jordan was coming to Birmingham until he saw it, he said. I was like, are you kidding me? Bloom said. Not only the greatest basketball player, but arguably the world's greatest athlete. I said, you're trying to tell me that this guy's going to get on a plane and he's going to end up in Birmingham, Alabama and play baseball? It's not going to happen. I don't care what the news reports or what my eyes see or my ears hear. It just is not gonna happen. So even though it said reporting to Birmingham, I still was completely in disbelief. 
and I was that way right up until the opening press conference the 93 Barons had been a talent laden team, with second baseman Ray Durham, third baseman Ron Coomer, designated hitter Olmedo Scenes and pitcher James Baldwin all destined for long major league careers. One veteran holdos were on the 94 team was outfielder Scott Tatter, who would be battling with Jordan and prospects Kerry Villery and Kevin Coughlin for playing time in the outfield. Tetter and Valerie were both multi-sport athletes, Tetter having been NCAA Division the third player of the year in basketball at Ohio Wesleyan and Valerie a standout football player of Southern Miss. At least among the outfielders, Tetter said, there was no resentment to a Jordan. I think everybody welcomed him because I knew the situation, that he was going to get his of bats. Tetter really emphasized that everybody was going to get a chance and he wrote it at outfielders, Tetter said. On some days Michael would DH, sometimes he played right field and then some other outfielders would get a chance to play. So there was no animosity, at all Joe with no cell phones, let alone no internet or social media, word of Jordan's assignment to Birmingham disseminated over the course of the next day through more traditional means, newspapers, as well as television and radio. The demand for Barron's tickets, not to mention Jordan's no. 45 White Sox jersey, spiked immediately. When I showed up the next day, clearly the world knew it, because there was a line out the door, folks wanting to buy tickets and buy anything, merchandise, whatever it was that we had, Nelson said. It was the end of the world as we knew it. We had six, phone, lines and they were jammed up that day, obviously for several days and weeks after that as well. Everybody wanted to get a piece of it. I was selling tickets all day long. They brought me lunch at the ticket window. I didn't even get to take a break. It was part of the excitement and part of the flurry of what was beginning to be just an avalanche. But it was also a lot of fun too. It was a roller coaster ride that entire season and it wasn't just a Birmingham thing. The Barons became a regional draw, and interest in Jordan's baseball exploits spread across the country. People would call us from Wyoming or Nebraska and say we're coming through Birmingham going to Florida on August 5th, are the Barons in town? Martin said. You walked through the parking lot and there were cars from all over the United States. It was more than anything I had ever seen before Jordan. A successful season at the gate meant the Barons drew 275, 000, 300, 000 fans over the course of 70 home games, or in the neighborhood 4,000 per game. In 94, the team played in front of a franchise record 467,867 fans of the Hoover Met, minus 6,684 per game. And that was with literal or no advance publicity. And the Jordan-led carnival continued on the road. The Barons set attendance records of every other ballpark in the Southern League, Bloom said. I often joke, not only did Michael make the Barons a lot of money, but he made the Southern League a very, very wealthy league, Bloom said. At the point, whether we were in Nashville, Orlando, Jacksonville, Memphis, Carolina, they all set their own attendance records. When you factor in both home and road, we played in front of just under a million people, a staggering number tagger said Jordan's presence added a level of excitement for the players as well. Probably the first three months of the season, everywhere we went was packed and crazy, Tagger said. We felt like rock stars. One time in Chattanooga, our bus was surrounded by so many people, we couldn't get out of it out of the parking lot, but they finally got police to let us out. But it was great playing in front of sold out places media attention followed, of course. Martin said in his early days of covering the Barons, he and the writer from the Birmingham Post Herald were the only reporters at the games, save for the occasional TV camera person who might stay a few innings to shoot highlights. When Jordan came to Birmingham, 150 members of the media were there for opening night. Big city columnists from New York, San Francisco, Chicago and Detroit occasionally dropped in for Barons games, while NBA writers routinely came to town to check in on their erstwhile superstar. The Barons were owned by a Japanese conglomerate at the time, so reporters from Japan and other foreign countries also followed the team in 94. There was such a publicity crush, the Barons sent media relations director Chris Pica on the road with the team for most of the first half of the season, a rare practice in the minor leagues. Though the Birmingham News Sports section was still driven by college football driven first and foremost, the paper built a summertime coverage around Jordan. I had to interview him every night, Martin said. The news said that I would have the game story every night and I had to have a Jordan story every night. And sometimes there was nothing there, but I had to have something. They said it can just be two paragraphs, but you've got to have something on Jordan and I'd go up to him after the game and he'd say don't come talk to me, Scott Tagler whoever is the one that got the game winning hit, go talk to him. 
I said I'm going to talk to him, but I've got to talk to you. Two celebrities descended on the Hoover met looking for a chance to rub elbows with Jordan. Charles Barkley, raised in nearby Leeds, was a frequent visitor. Country singer Kenny Rogers made the trip to Hoover from his home in Georgia for one game, showing up unannounced with a huge entourage. He wanted to shake hands with Jordan, Martin said. They had very strict rules about anybody on the field, but her tech gave the OK for Kenny Rogers to go out on the field and say hello to Jordan. Rogers carried his whole entourage out there with him. It must have been 15 people wandering around out in front of the dugout. I'm sure her decade was having a stroke even more memorable was the day a man showed up at the Hoover Met claiming to be Scotty Pippen, Jordan's superstar teammate with the Bulls. He tried to get in the clubhouse, got all the way down to the clubhouse doors, but didn't get to go in there, Bloom said. You just never knew what was going to happen on a given day Jordan and the minor league lifestyle no story of Jordan's season with the Barons would be complete without mention of the Jordan Cruiser, the luxury bus the team traveled on in 94. The myth of the Jordan Cruiser is that Jordan paid for the bus, when in reality he merely helped the team acquire it. Birmingham-based Thrasher Brothers Trailways, which continues to provide charter buses for the Barons on an annual basis, provided the 45-foot bus, which was dull green with a distinctive curving British pink stripe down the side. He apparently didn't know that we traveled by bus, Bloom said. The way I heard it, when he was told, he goes, I'm not going so they built this odd colored new bus. We often joked it looked like the Partridge family. Michael never paid a dime for the bus. That became such a great story. The way I describe it, his name helped arrange a lease between three different companies. The luxury of the Jordan Cruiser has also been overstated, Bloom said. Though by comparison to what the Barons had used in previous years, it was definitely an improvement. So many minor league buses were just old and dilapidated, Bloom said. The Jordan Cruiser was not a floating Las Vegas casino. I mean, it was new. And the only thing that it had that made it different was a semicircle couch in the back that was created for him to relax and stretch his legs. Jordan quickly realized, though, the couch in the back wasn't the most comfortable seat on the bus. Soon enough, he was sitting in a regular row like his teammates. Though Jordan was making only $850 a month as a Birmingham Baron, he still had his NBA savings and his annual endorsement earnings on which to fall back. Had he wanted to do so, he could have leveraged his celebrity into a different mode of transportation. That's probably what I respect the most, Tedder said. He could have flown to every series. He rode the bus, every series, didn't fly to any road trips. The first Friday night game at the Hoover met and then driving to Orlando after the game, he was right there with us on the bus for 9, 10 hours. The Barons kept the Jordan Cruiser for 2 or 3 years after 94, Bloom said, though it eventually became outdated. Jordan autographed the door and paint after the season, and the bus was eventually sold to a charter company in Washington, D.C. As Tedder noted, Jordan didn't big Thomas fellow Barons when it came to travel accommodations. He also didn't want any special treatment as a player, and became something of an ideal teammate. It was a great experience, Tedder said. Obviously when he came in the clubhouse, everybody was in awe, but after the first week, week and a half, he was just another teammate. He kind of blended in, worked really hard to try to get better in baseball, and really fit in great with the clubhouse and the players and everything we did as a team. Jordan did not play in the Barons' first game because he had agreed to participate in the Windy City Classic, a post-spring exhibition game between the White Sox and Cubs at Wrigley Field on April 7. But he was in the lineup for Game 2 of the Hoover Met, going 0-4-3 with two strikeouts before a crowd of 10,359. He proved to be a quick study, at least initially. A 13-game hitting streak pushed his average to 327 by the end of April. Veteran baseball writer Tim Kirkjian, then with Sports Illustrated and now with Aston, was among those who checked in with Jordan and the Barons to see what all the fuss was about. From Kona, told me his work ethic was off the charts, he listened to everything Tito told him, Kirkjian said. He never once gave him a yeah but, or no, let's do it this way he nearly had so much to learn and the best person to learn from was his manager. They developed this tremendous working relationship and friendship right away. They are still best friends to this day, but only because Michael Jordan recognized I don't know what I'm doing here and if I'm ever going to be good, I better learn from the experts. Jordan built close relationships with several of his teammates, including Tedder, the former college basketball star and minor league veteran. That friendship continued after Tedder was released late in the season and caught on with the Chicago Cubs, whose double affiliate was in Orlando, also in the Southern League. They came to Orlando that day after I got released and my bats didn't make it to Orlando, Tedder said. 
So I went over to Michael and said, Hey Mike, I need some bats. I came back from batting practice and there were three Michael Jordan bats in my locker. That's just the kind of guy he was. Of course, I didn't use those bats. I kept those bats. Those who spent time around Jordan in 94 have often raved about how approachable he was. If you had to cover a celebrity, he was the one to cover, Martin said. And Jordan wasn't afraid to fully engage in the minor league lifestyle, including clubhouse card and board games, Jordan was particularly fond of yachts. Minor league teams don't have full-time, fully staffed grounds crews like their major league counterparts, which Jordan also learned one afternoon at the Hoover Met. One day, he's coming in on Sunday afternoon and we're pulling the tarp off the field, Nelson said. Somebody says to him, hey listen, why don't you help us? And he goes, uh okay so he grabbed the tarp and he helped us pull the top off the field. He was one of the guys and he wanted to be one of the guys. Anytime you went down to the clubhouse, you always saw him having fun, yucking it up with teammates or the coaches or with Francona. He was always very gracious. I personally will always be very appreciative that that's how nice he was, not only to the fans that came out that year, but to our staff as well. Big Max, pick up basketball and nightlife Jordan may have left the NBA, but he remained among the country's top advertising pitchmen while playing for the Barons. He continued to endorse Nike, Gatorade and McDonald's, among other tent pole companies. The first time I met him, I walked into the locker room at lunch, during spring training, and he was sitting in there eating a McDonald's Big Mac, Martin said. I said, good lord, I wouldn't expect you to be eating a Big Mac. He said, hey, they pay me a lot of money. People that pay me money, I patronize them. We'd go out to the Met sometimes and the TV crews would be taking down all the tarps that they had covering up the advertisements to shoot commercials. Jordan was constantly doing commercials when he was with the Barons. Somebody told me that he made $31 million the year he was in Birmingham and naturally, the world's greatest basketball player didn't abandon his primary sport entirely. The Barons players and staff held regular evening pickup games at Rye Village, an apartment community not far from the Hoover Met. It wasn't long before Jordan caught wind of the game and got in on the action. He pulls up in his Mercedes and he strolls to the court, Bloom remembered. And I wound up on his team. The ball starts with him and I set a pick and then he looked down and he waves me up and he says, CB, I don't need this. He steps back and nails like a 30-foot jumper on this asphalt court. When we first started, there might have been six people, eight people, but then word got out in the development and all of a sudden people were coming out of their apartments. And people were coming from wherever else. They had a chance to see Michael Jordan play three on three. That was a pretty neat thing having been a basketball star in college, Tucker was used to being the best player in the Barons pickup games. That obviously changed when Jordan took the court. Still, Tucker was able to hold his own, at least until Jordan's famous competitive streak came out. We would play into 16 and I hit a couple of three pointers and hit a couple of jumpers and he kind of looked at me. We got to 15 and he said, that's it. This ain't no Gatorade commercial anymore. I didn't score after that. They came back and won one, seven, one, five. That's just how competitive he was. Ping pong, cards, pick up basketball, he didn't want to lose in anything. Jordan was generally cooperative with the media, which most days consisted of Marvin Rubin Grant of the Birmingham Post Herald. He seemed to be aware of the fact that I had a job to do and he didn't make my job harder, Martin remembered. But Jordan wasn't entirely an open book. Martin's Birmingham news colleague, Doug Sagarist, wrote a story about what Jordan did in Birmingham when he wasn't playing baseball. Sagaris learned that Jordan frequented a certain pool hall, where he and Barkley would often play. And he also spent a lot of time at Sammy's Go-Go, a well-known adult entertainment establishment off Valley Avenue in Homewood. Before publishing that information about Jordan's nighttime habits, however, Sagaris editors wanted confirmation from the man himself. Due to his friendly relationship with Jordan, they sent Martin to ask him about it. So I went down to the dugout, and I waited until he came trotting off the field, Martin said. And I told him about the story and said I need to ask you about these places he said, what are they? And the first one oh yeah man, when Barclay's in town, we go over there and shoot pool. What's your other one? I said, Sammy's Jordan smile went all the way around it from ear to ear. He said, man, I'm not going to let you quote me saying and I go to Sammy's I said hey Michael, people go to Sammy's and he said, yeah, but you're not going to be able to quote me saying I go to Sammy's Jordan a baseball prospect past the age of 30 and with no baseball pedigree to speak of, Jordan was no one's idea of a top prospect. And were his name Michael Smith instead of Michael Jordan, there's a good chance he'd have never touched the field at the Hoover Met. But that doesn't mean he was a complete failure at the game. Gurbjian said he bristles whenever he hears that.
I'm amused but at times angry by people who think Michael Jordan failed at baseball, Kirbjian said. I thought it was a rousing success to take away basically 15 years from the hardest game to play, at least in my opinion, go straight to double where they throw really hard and to hit over 200, to steal 30 bases, drive in 51 runs, that was a miracle. He willed himself to do that. Jordan's early season hot streak didn't last, however, and his average hovered around the 200 mark for much of the second half of the season. He hit his first home run on July 30th at the Met, then added two more by season's end. His final numbers included a 202 batting average, a 289 on base percentage, 17 doubles, a triple, 3 homers, 51 RBIs and 30 steals in 48 attempts. Most importantly, perhaps, he was giving his best effort. I saw a guy that did not take this as a joke, Bloom said. His work ethic was legendary. And he did not want to embarrass himself, which he didn't. And you look back at his numbers and not always talk about how positive they were. And I still can't believe he had three home runs. He drove in 50 and stole 30 bases. Those are numbers that we'll have players this upcoming year and last year that they will put those numbers together. That shows you how extraordinary he was. Rumors have always circulated as to what was Jordan's ultimate motivation in playing baseball. One wild conspiracy theory was that Jordan had secretly been suspended from the NBA for illegal gambling and played baseball to fill time until he was allowed back into basketball, NBA. Commissioner David Stern, who died earlier this year, always dismissed this. The Chicago Sun-Times reported in late June that Jordan would be headed back to the NBA in 95. He denied it. So of all the things Jordan could have done in 94, why did he play baseball? Tedder said he thinks it was all about Jordan's relationship with his father. I think his summer with the minor leagues really rejuvenated him to go back to basketball because I think he lost that intensity and love for the game of basketball, Tedder said. He had three championship rings. He felt like he'd done everything, but his dad's dream was for him to play in the major leagues. I think he wanted to prove to him he could make it to the major leagues. He did everything he possibly could, early work, post-game, work. He would hit after games with the lights on. Nobody in the park and he'd still be taking batting practice. After the games Jordan was listed at 6 foot, minus 6 and 205 pounds as a baseball player, exceptionally tall and long limb for an outfielder in the mid-1990s. Most players of similar stature in those days were pitchers. Jordan was certainly no pitcher. But could he have made the major leagues as an outfielder? Bloom thinks so. He was not going to be as dominant as he was on the basketball court, but he certainly had the talent, Bloom said. Who knows, if he had played at an earlier age, as well as played a little bit longer, how far he could have gotten in baseball. But he certainly had the talent to play baseball. There's no doubt the minor league sees the men's around Labor Day, and promising prospects are typically called up to the major league team for the final month of the season. The question as to if Jordan would have played for the White Sox in 94 became moot when the Major League Baseball Players Association went on strike August 12, eventually wiping out the final six weeks of the regular season, as well as the playoffs and World Series. So if not, in 94, when might have Jordan made it to the majors? Bloom and Nelson both think he'd have spent the majority of 95 of Triple in Nashville and maybe made it to Chicago late that season, likely seeing action primarily as a pinch runner and defensive sub. Martin, however, figured Jordan's Major League debut would have come much sooner. I think he would have been in the Major Leagues before the year 94 was over, Martin said. The other thing that he had bet would make him a sure Major Leaguer was the ability to draw crowds in Chicago. If he could go up there and hit 190, why wouldn't you have him in the Major Leagues? The aftermath Jordan refuted speculation that he would be headed back to basketball after the 94 baseball ended. He participated in the Arizona Fall League that November and was back in spring training with the White Sox as minor leaguers the following February. With the strike still unsettled, MLB owners put together a plan to use replacement players in 95, with various failed prospects filling major league rosters during spring training. Jordan seemed like a natural to play for the SCAD White Sox, at least as far as club president Eddie Einhorn was concerned. Einhorn got to pressuring him to be a strike breaker, Martin said. Jordan said he wouldn't do it. He said, I might not be a baseball major leaguer, but I'm a basketball major leaguer. They knew they could sell out Kamiski Park, with Jordan coming up there to play baseball. So when he said he wouldn't play, Einhorn started making it difficult on him at spring training, like moving him out of the major league locker room and pubbing him with the minor leaguers. And so he quit on March 11th, the story broke that Jordan was walking away from baseball.
A week later came the now legendary fax transmission to media members from Jordan's agent, David Falk, reading only two words, I am back the general manager up at Nashville, boy he was planning big, Martin said. He thought he'd be coming to triple of the year. And they told him that he could not sell tickets using Jordan's name. So he had his commercials for selling tickets, had them shot in the locker room. The GM was sitting in front of the locker with no 45 jersey in it, polishing a pair of shoes that had no 45 on them, telling viewers how much you're going to enjoy the season this year in Nashville. Jordan played his first game back with the Bulls on March 19th in Indianapolis, wearing his baseball no 45, rather than his familiar 23. He scored 19 points in 43 minutes against the Indiana Pacers, then nine days later scored 55 in a win over the New York Knicks. The MLB strike ended by court order on April 2nd, when a federal judge ruled that the owners planned to use replacement players violated labor law. The 95 season was delayed by three weeks, but baseball has avoided any other work stoppages in the 25 years since. The Birmingham Barons returned to the field minus Jordan on April 6, 95, beating Memphis 2-0. And though, as Martin says, everybody had their Jordan stories that they wanted to tell, 95 was just another season at the Hoover Med and in the Southern League. It was sort of like seeing the remaining members of the Beatles play without John Lennon, Nelson said. It was just not the same. You went from being the ultimate buzz and the ultimate baseball story to back to being a normal minor league baseball.